Hello and welcome everybody to our first field service, field service lightning implementation training. Uh, my name is Katrin Burton and I'm a Director of Service Cloud Alliances here at Salesforce. Uh, let's please also welcome Nikolai Avrutov from Click Software. So um, I'm going to record this session and uh, the key purpose of this session is to create a recorded asset for our partners that everyone can take advantage of to learn more about implementing uh, field service. Uh, today we are going about uh, going over the general setup and then we have two more sessions coming that go deeper into mobile configuration next week same time and the week after that into scheduling. Um, please post your questions to the question section on the sidebar. Uh, we will answer them throughout the session and with this I'm handing over now to Nikolai. Thank you Katrina and thank you for hosting me for this webinar. Um, I'm, uh, I'm happy to go through the, through the deck and the org that I prepared for this session today. Um, I'm going to highlight some of the key elements you really want to take into consideration um, as you set up uh, a field service lighting environment. Um, and um, feel free to ask questions as we go along and uh, let's get the show underway. So I'm going to talk about some initial considerations that you want to uh, take and discuss with your customer. Uh, before you even start implementing the, the environment and a bit of a mind, mindset or a framework to work within with your customer. We're going to talk about installing the managed package uh, and a few naming conventions and changes that took place recently. Uh, we'll go for the, the guidance on how to use the permission sets for field service lighting, the sharing models, um, uh, the data integration rules, it's not disabling, it's unticking a certain box, so this uh, title is a bit misleading. We'll talk briefly about feed tracking and then uh, in detail about page layout assignment. And finally, uh, I will address the, the question of service territories uh, modeling, how to set up service territories, how to think about them, some best practices around this, a very sensitive topic that can significantly impact the performance and the efficacy of your environment. Um, and if we have some time left, I'll talk about work types and skills, uh, an easier topic amongst the many that I would like to uh, address today. So some initial considerations before you begin the implementation for your customer. First of all, be sure to study uh, these documents. The deck will be available after the recording, but um, the, the Field Service Lighting Managed Package Guide uh, is a very important document for you to review, print, hang on the wall, have handy and available uh, every time you deal with Field Service Lightning. Uh, on the installation links of the managed package, there's always a link to what's new. And a lot of great functionality was added in the last uh, version and wait to see the next uh, versions as they roll out. There's going to be a lot of exciting functionality, so you definitely want to stay up to, up to date. And this document, that documentation becomes better and better every time uh, and certainly is helpful. The, the Salesforce help for FSL and FSL mobile uh, is a very rich resource and you definitely want to study and have that as the rent. There's a lot of uh, tips and tricks and the field service uh, mobile application specifically is quite different from Salesforce One. So you want to go through the documentation and be aware of everything that is there and of course the partner community. These resources are also a great uh, preparation material or at least a starting point to prepare for the field service lighting certification, uh, which I hope you're planning to take in the near future as it is available and will be a sign of expertise for you to broadcast the world around field service lighting. So before you make the implementation, and hopefully your customer had the conversation with a sales team of a similar type, but uh, make sure you and the customer agree uh, where they are at on their field service journey the moment you start to implement, where they would like to be 3, 6, 12, 24, and 36 months down the road. And this chart really depicts it very well. On, on, on the x-axis, we're looking at the field service sophistication, how complicated uh, the field service operation is, how many moving parts are there, how many people are involved between taking a customer's request and actually delivering a, a service out there in the field. And uh, the y-axis is the degree of optimization, how optimal, how automated, how sophisticated the scheduling and the dispatching process is uh, at the moment uh, on the operation. And if we look at the journey, the journey from the very beginning, the first, uh, the first place or the first step is to get visibility into the field, understand 
what's going on, where your team members are, how long it takes to complete certain jobs, uh, how long it takes to travel from one place to another, what happens in real time. That visibility is quite fundamental. If you don't see what's going on uh, out there in the field, there's no way for you to do anything else. So that's the, the, start, the, settings, the starting point of, of field service uh, management. Once you have that in place, you can start thinking about containing costs whether you're using some of the automation uh, abilities of an application as robust as, robust as field service lightning or, or manual Excel calculation, the first thing you want to do once you have that visibility is to manage your costs and try to reduce them as much as possible. Talk to your customers about their cost uh, drivers in the field service operation. Is it the, the gas cost? Is it the insurance? Uh, is it the hourly wage of the employees? Uh, is it losing parts and in inventory along the way? Uh, is it missing out on SLAs? Is it customer complaints and customer attrition? Talk about the costs and understand what what is it that they would like to manage most, uh, and what are they managing today? Once you're at that stage, the next thing to consider is optimization. How do you optimize the way your field operation runs so you can get more services completed, or the same amount of services with less amount of people out in the field, or how can you leverage uh, the presence out in the field to do additional work and additional services. So that's where optimization starts to come to place. This is the point where many customers will want to start deploy, deploying some uh, advanced automation and optimization capabilities such as the ones offered by Field Service Lightning. This will, this will also make the implementation, the implementation itself more complex and you will deploy uh, more advanced tools that Field Service Lightning has to offer. Maximizing the value of every interaction relates to uh, scenarios where you're so optimal, you're so sophisticated, you're so smooth sailing with your field operation that now you're at the point of wowing your customers. Uh, for many op field service operations, the technician or the mobile resource is the only human face that the end consumer actually sees. So it's coming prepared with all needed information. Uh, it's being able to upsell and suggest additional services that are relevant. Uh, it's coming with, with the knowledge about the customer, about the customer preferences, etc. So perhaps this is a point where fuel service lighting takes a, a broader uh, utilization of the service cloud and even the Salesforce platform as a whole, uh, tapping into customer accounts uh, and customer details, tapping into other uh, applications, maybe engaging some CPQ capabilities, et cetera. Maximizing the value of every interaction is making sure that a person out in the field has everything he or she requires, not only to be successful from the first time of visit, but also to be able to do anything else possible on that very same interaction to wow the customer uh, and make it as optimal both for the consumer as well as for the company itself. And finally, you're looking at disrupting and differentiating uh, in your industry by the way you're de delivering service. This is where some innovative models uh, of service delivery could be introduced. Uh, and of course, this is taking an even further uh, utilization of uh, the artificial intelligence of the Salesforce platform, the advanced optimization capabilities of field service lightning, uh, and other capabilities of the platform. Extremely important that you and the customer understand where you start the journey from. What's the starting point? What are you going to do for your first iteration and how sophisticated and advanced it needs to be? Or in other words, what, is the minimum vi what are the minimal viable requirements to get the customer life and successful? Then what will be what would the next sprint would look like and the one after and the one after and what the timeline should be? Structuring this well in advance uh, will align your expectations very nicely with the aspirations of your customers uh, with regards to their field service operation. This will also allow you to understand the challenges that you're tackling. It could be the basics, the core challenges of visibility control that often translates to uh, smart reporting producing the right reports, having the right information at the fingertips of the, of the service operation. It could be tactical. About It's all about enabling the dispatcher or the service manager or the scheduler uh, to be more efficient in their decision-making process, in handling the changing circumstances throughout the day, uh, and leveraging the ability to monitor in real time what goes on 
uh, in the field. This, of course, comes with a whole other set of configurations that will focus on the disk dispatcher uh, and some of the optimization capability. And finally, strategic considerations. Uh, this has to do a lot with uh, the stage of optimization, of optimizing your field operation, managing your costs like traveling over time, and increasing utilization of your workforce. It all relates to the optimization capabilities. Can you squeeze in more work by rerouting the workload so people drive less and spend more time on the road? Can you push and prioritize work in such a, in such a manner that you avoid uh, overtime and use it only when absolute, absolutely necessary and balancing it with things such as penalties on SLAs? And finally, improving service levels, what is the meaning of that? Is it avoiding the penalties of SLAs or actually uh, improving uh, customer retain, retention or enhancing your brand out in the field? So couple that with the journey uh, that, that your customer is taking in the field service optimization and you start to understand or getting a, the big picture of where and what the customer is mo most interested on. And of course, this will also give you indication as to what kind of metrics you will want to keep, or you will want to keep track of. Uh, Field Service Lightning, Wave for Field Service Lightning was launched uh, last month, and this is an absolutely uh, amazing tool for field service operations. Nevertheless, you want to make sure that you agree with the customer, what are you measuring? How, what determines the efficacy of the field service operation? What kind of metrics, what kind of fields, and in which objects you will need to create to keep track of these metrics? Is it actual time spent uh, on site? Is it averages? Is it reduction of travel over time? Uh, is, it a, is it the quantity or the amount of services delivered in a single day or SLAs, main, or, or SLAs kept? This will affect your implementation uh, by way of uh, setting up the right fields, the right formulas, uh, the right parameters to produce the necessary reports, to produce the necessary information in real time for your customers. These are high level, but it is very important uh, that you align yourself with the customer not only on specific requirements and needs and demands and, um, and, and, and other elements of the configuration itself, but rather where are we now, where are we going, uh, and where do we want to be uh, in certain periods of time uh, into the future, and how do we measure success. Uh, extremely important, and while there's a lot of common denominators around uh, across field service operations, each operation will be unique. Each operation will have its own cost structure, uh, its, own, its own considerations and priorities. Um, although it's all field service, uh, it could be radically different. And the meaning of success for one operation uh, could be radically different from the meaning of success for another. Uh, Understanding the challenges you tackle, the metrics you want to measure, the journey you're taking with your customer will allow you to set your implementation for success. So from now I'm going to uh, focus on some uh, key elements in setting up an environment. Um, I'm not necessarily going to set everything up from scratch to be efficient with our time, but I'm going to pinpoint some important elements and things that you really want to be aware of uh, when you're initially setting up uh, a field service lighting environment. First of all, be aware uh, of the naming uh, convention and, and some changes that took place um, with uh, with fuel service uh, with fuel service lightning. So, and sorry, there's there's one bullet that throws me off. It's unnecessary here. So, starting with the summer 17 release, we intend to push the managed package of fuel service lightning to customer orgs just like the updates of the Salesforce releases themselves. Up until now, you would need to go to the managed package links and install them on a fuel service lighting in environment, on a fuel service lighting enabled org. So we're going to start push, uh, to push the, the new releases uh, to Salesforce orgs. The summer 17 push uh, is going to happen on, on the very last, on the on the update of the very last pod uh, of Salesforce. As you know, it happens with a few se in several uh, steps. So the last step, the, when, when Salesforce uh, make their final update to their last org, this is when the push of the summer 17 
managed package of fuel service lighting is going to take place for summer 17. Now, by winter 18, we're going to be fully aligned with the Salesforce cadence. So when an org will be updated with uh, the winter 18 release of Salesforce, uh, if it's a fuel service lighting enabled org with a fuel service lighting managed package installed, the update is going to get pushed uh, automatically. That being said, the installation links are still there. We're still going to make the, the new uh, features available uh, to test and explore before the official release. Um, and without committing to a specific time frame, the managed package is the, the update for the managed package is usually released three to seven weeks after the Salesforce release. So um, if you want to see the new features, you, if you want to explore them, if you want to leverage them before we actually push it automatically to the org, you still can by following the installation org. Now, in order to remove confusion, uh, we, we did some name changing of the, of the managed package. What used to be Spring 17 has been renamed to Summer 17. So when we release the next package, it's going to be for the following release. So don't get confused by the name. So we didn't release a summer package yet. Uh, it's the Spring 17 that was renamed to Summer 17. So this is very important for you to keep in mind. Uh, if we follow the installation link right now, the Summer 17 package is going to be there. This does not affect the roadmap timeline. Uh, if there were certain features that you were expecting to see in January or uh, in September, the timeline has not changed. The roadmap remains the same. We just bumped the name uh, one season up. So what used to be Spring 17 is now Summer 17, and we will follow along. So by the time we make the push to Winter 18, it will be the Winter 18 managed package uh, that will be updated together with the Winter 18 Salesforce release. Uh, Nico, quick question about this. So when you uh, go to the page where you download the managed package, uh, there's links to documentation. And I think currently the documentation still references, oh no, they, they updated it. Uh, okay, never mind. I looked uh, earlier this, this week and it was called still Spring 17. Let me see. Managed package guide. Yeah, it's now all summer. Okay, good. Thank you. So <laughs> So I saw that question in one of the communities as well, yeah. uh, and yes, it has been updated. Um, everything gets itself updated as we speak, so uh, the documentation is there. You certainly have access to all the new information uh, about the managed package, the current uh, capabilities, everything is right here. Okay, thanks. Perfect. Uh, one other question that came in from the attendees. Uh, so someone is asking if a field service will uh, provide a product part management soon. Yes, part management is on the roadmap. There are certain part management capabilities already in place in field service lighting, and they will be enhanced uh, over the next few releases. OK, thanks. OK, so permission set guidance. When you install the managed package, uh, field service lighting, one of its abilities is to create the needed permission, permission sets uh, for each and every type of user, whether it's the mobile resource, whether it's the dispatcher, uh, whether it's the administrator. Uh, there are certain permission sets that the field service lighting package is, is able to create for you. And these are the minimum uh, required levels of access for each and every single role. So if a dispatcher needs to be able to see the GANs, he would have the needed permission sets. So we certainly encourage you to use these permission sets because they also provide the permission set licenses to the user to whom the permission set is assigned. Uh, and without the permission set licenses, uh, a mobile resource will not be able to, to get scheduled uh, using the application. Uh, a dispatcher will not have access to the GANs. So the permission sets are quite important. When you refresh, and I will show you how we refresh, but when you refresh the permission sets of field service lightning, it does not alter any additional permissions that you gave to the user after the installation. It's only going to make sure that the minimum required permissions uh, are actually there. And if, there's, and if there are any changes from one release to another, it will update uh, 
uh, these permissions. But it will not change anything else that you may have done um, uh, on top uh, of the permission sets that we have provided. Now, it's not a recommendation to use these permission sets of field service lightning. Uh, it's a guidance. Um, and if you're not using uh, the permission sets provided by Field Service Lightning, expect to have challenges, expect things to not work properly. Uh, and when you, and if you will open a support request on that, on, on that topic, the first thing that they will ask you to do is to make sure that your permission sets are up to date as per Field Service Lightning settings. Um, and another comment, uh, and I think there was some confusion with, docum with documentation in previous releases, but the dispatcher should not be uh, configured or set up as a mobile, as, as a resource uh, in field service lighting. It's just a user in the Salesforce org with the right permission set license, with the right permission set. Uh, there's no need to set up dispatchers as resources uh, unless they need to be both. So let's take a look at where we do those permission set licenses uh, configurations. When you install the Field Service Lightning package, um, at this stage, there are two places where you manage and administer the application. Some elements happen in the setup section, other that are more related to the logic of Field Service Lightning will be happening in the Field Service Admin uh, app, so Field Service Operational and Field Service Admin. When you go to uh, getting started, you have the permission set section right here. So start with Field Service Lightning Admin, uh, and then agent, resource, and dispatcher. These are the permission sets that you want to create. Uh, when you need to refresh, uh, or if there are additional changes, all you need to, to do is to come here and make sure that you refresh uh, these right here. These are the permission sets that will be properly set up for each and every single user. This is where you want to be doing that. Absolutely important. Once you have that in place, you're able to head over to setup and assign the right the needed permission sets uh, to all the needed users. So, uh, of course, for yourself uh, as the as the super user or the administrator, make sure you have uh, all the needed permission sets so you can access the dispatch board, uh, the GANs, so you're able to uh, to administer everything. For other users like the mobile. Well, give them the mobile uh, license and the mobile permissions, etc. So this is where you would set it up, and the starting point is right here on the field service admin. Run it, and you don't have to think twice about what permission sets you should be providing to each and every single user. There's quite a few of them, quite a few parameters that go in there. So this is extremely important that you follow this. Um, and again, um, if something doesn't work, if a user is not able to see what he or she are supposed to see, Ask yourself, am I providing the right permission sets for that particular user? No, if there's any questions. No, not no further questions so far. Okay. I think we answered all of them. Okay, uh, sharing model. The so field service lightning. Um, follows the logic of field service. So for example, um, if, if you have a mobile resource to whom you're dispatching work, uh, there's really no sense for, uh, for that mobile resource to see that work order uh, before it's actually assigned to him. And once it's assigned to a particular resource, uh, others should not have visibility to it. So we follow uh, the, private, uh, uh, the private sharing, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the private sharing model. Um, we recommend that you don't uh, change the that. And when you're setting this up, there's a particular process uh, in which you want to do it. So first of all, be sure to set up the relevant objects uh, to the private sharing model. So uh, these are the service appointments, service resources, uh, service territory, and the work order. And this is where you do it. So security controls, sharing settings. Uh, edit, and the objects will be right here. So here's your service appointment. Make sure it's set to private, uh, service resource, service territory, work order. This will allow Field Service Lightning uh, to use its own logic uh, 
to, to make these objects visible to the right and the relevant users. So the dispatcher will see uh, only the territory that he or she are assigned to see using the logic and the configurations within field service sliding rather than the default, uh, the default setting uh, for the service territory. A work order will be visible to the mobile resources when it's time to present it to them, when it's time for them to be able to work with it, as opposed to generally accessible to all. Now, how do you set it up and what is the right sequence? So you start with taking these objects to private. Great. Now you need to create the service territories. This is your first step, followed by service territory members, uh, so you, the user territories, and you need to run the sharing automator. Let's go through all of these steps one by one. So creating service territories. Service territories, and we will talk more about service territories uh, later down this presentation, but service territories is the grouping of your resources. Uh, it could be geographical. We have folks working in Los Angeles, and we have teams working in San Francisco. Uh, it could be functional. We have a maintenance uh, team, and we have an installation team. Uh, it could be a combination of both. You can have a hierarchy uh, of service territories. Uh, and service territories is also how you present information to the dispatcher on the Gantt. So if you have several dispatchers and each dispatcher is responsible for a different team or a different territory, service territories will allow you to make sure that each dispatcher or scheduler are looking at the right set of information. So service territories are quite fundamental. And when you're setting them up, give it a name. If it's a hierarchy, so let's say uh, you have maintenance and installation teams in uh, Los Angeles. So Los Angeles will be the parent territory, and then the maintenance and the service and the and the install teams will be the uh, the children. Um, once you allow a user to see Los Angeles, he or she will see all the here will have access to the entire hierarchy. So if there's a parent, this is where you set it up. And operating hours, operating hours is the is the standard business hours of that particular service service territory. Now, you could still have every single resource to have different operating hours of its own. So if you have people working shifts, uh, if you have people working through in different days or times of the day, that's fine. The moment a specific resource have his own or her own operating hours, the system will look at them uh, as a priority. But you do need to set up a default of operating hours. Operating hours is a separate object, and let's cover it quickly because we need it to be in order for us to set up a service territory. <clears throat> so it's uh, it's kind of a visual uh, visual uh, diagram. Uh, we have a convenient visual force component, but you can also set it up manually right below. Just set up your time slots. These are the time slots that you see right here. You can just draw using this visual force component uh, your time. Um, you can you can uh, you can copy it to use later or copy to the next day if needed, uh, and you can also define by right clicking uh, and renaming it to extended. You can cre you can uh, make the, the system know that this is an overtime section. So pretty convenient uh, UI overall, uh, and this is how you set up the system to know that there are specific operating hours uh, that it needs to be following. Uh, these are the business hours. Uh, of a particular uh, group, person, territory. So once you have those uh, operating hours set up, don't forget to press the big blue uh, Save button. And when you're setting up your territory, just make a reference to the right calendar. So always think about something default. Unless a person in this territory has specific hours, the default operating hours are 9 to 5, 7 to 8, uh, weekends included, overtime is after this period of time or after this hour. Uh, but create something default. And as soon as you create a service resource and assign him or her to this territory, unless they have their own operating hours, these will be the defaults that will be uh, used by the system to uh, consider that person as available or not available for work. 
always remember to check the active box, otherwise that territory won't get activated. Um, and it's convenient if you know that you're going to have quite a few service territories, but you're not activating them all yet, but you're here, so you're setting them up, so you might as well. So you can create a few, and when, need, when the time comes, uh, you can activate them. And the address, very important uh, uh, element. The meaning of this address. Theoretically, service resources begin their day either by driving from home to their first job or by checking in in their office. It could be a warehouse where they pick up parts. It could be an office where they check in uh, from some reason. Um, of course, most efficient is to just start driving from home uh, to your first work site. But there needs to be a default. And that default for a particular service territory is the address that you put here. This is going to be the center of work. This is going to be uh, the address that is the default for this particular territory and for every service resource that belongs to that service territory. So um, when it starts to calculate travel time, from, for example, to the first uh, service appointment, unless the resource have his or her own address, this will be the address that the system will start its calculation from as it begins scheduling throughout the day. And, and the end result uh, should be uh, something along those lines. This is a showroom. Let me just go to San Francisco. Uh, you will have the address, and the system will recognize it. You can confirm the geocoding. Um, and further down below, right from here, you can start adding service territory members if you need to. But you can also do it from the resource side, and we will do it together. We have a question and in regarding that uh, to that topic. So, for operating hours, how do you define the time zone for that territory? Uh, it's right here. So when you when you create it, the, when you create a, the, a, a new operating hours calendar, you select the time zone for this particular uh, operating hour, um, and you want to make sure that it's aligned. Uh, with the service resource itself, if possible, if relevant. But this is the place where you do it. Thanks. Okay. So we created the service territories. The next step for you is to create the service territory members. So make sure you have users in place. How do you set up users? So a service resource essentially is a user in your Salesforce org that has the permission set license assigned to him as a mobile resource, um, and you are now uh, creating as a service resource within field service lightning. So your very first step, your very first step is to create a Salesforce user for each and every mobile resource, and I want to emphasize that. If you want to leverage the scheduling logic of Field Service Lightning, um, if you want to schedule a resource, regardless of whether it's a human uh, or a physical asset, like a truck, it needs to have uh, a user in the Salesforce environment. So when you have a particular user that you know that you will be scheduling him or her, you want to make sure that he or she has the right permission set assignment, is the FSL resource license and FSL resource permissions. right? And these are generated as soon as you press the permission set uh, generation for, for uh, mobile resources. These two are essential, uh, the PSL and the permission set uh, itself, uh, for the mobile resource to be recognized and, and, and to be able to activate him or her uh, as you configure him uh, in the system. Okay. Uh, so the Gantt label is what will be shown under the person's name on the Gantt. Uh, this is the custom, a custom field, and we can and we will talk about it uh, on one of the next safe sections. Uh, capacity based. If you're managing a mega resource or a contractor, checking this boolean uh, will convert the user from uh, a named resource that you can you know schedule an X amount of work in a particular day uh, to a resource to whom you can schedule using a capacity. So, if you're working with a contracting company and you don't know uh, the names or the, and you're not managing the actual individuals that do the work uh, in that contracting company, but rather just you're prepared to send a workload uh, to that contract 
next, and somebody there will allocate the work internally. It becomes a capacity-based resource, uh, and this is where you check the box. You want to make sure that resource is checked, and you want to make sure that it's included in the scheduling optimization. This needs to be done uh, by default. Uh, travel speed. Travel speed was relevant for aerial routing uh, when field service lighting uh, calculated travel uh, in a straight line from point A to point B, you had the ability to manipulate uh, the average speed as well as the travel speed pair resource. Field service lighting today offers street level routing. Uh, and street level routing considers the actual roads to be driven, the speed at these roads that you can drive at, so travel speed becomes uh, redundant. Location relates to the inventory uh, that you might manage on that particular resource, so the stock that this resource will carry in his or her van. I'm sorry to take a little step, a step back. We have one more operating hour question, Nico. Um, is it possible right. to make exceptions in the operating hours? Sometimes our technicians need to stay past certain operating hours. Um, so two things to that end. <clears throat> when it comes to operating hours, first of all, um, as I mentioned before, you're able to set up overtime. And you can allow the system to, to use that overtime when needed. And this is best practice uh, when it makes sense. Now, um, if, if you're talking about a scenario that is completely ad hoc, uh, very exceptional, uh, and you just need people to stay beyond, uh, whatever the rules you set up in field service lighting, whatever automation you use, the scheduler always will have the option uh, to override and manually schedule on the gain. So um, even if my day, if my even if my overtime ends at 8 p.m., if I know that I need to assign one more job uh, to go until 9 p.m., and I know that it's okay, and I have it confirmed with the operation, I can just drag and drop uh, an, a service appointment uh, on the GAN to go beyond. It will show you a rule violation, uh, but you can still do it. Now, if you want the system to be uh, able to allow a person to stay beyond a certain uh, standard hour without raising a rule violation, and you want to be able to book an appointment or have the optimization engine to put it there, is the overtime uh, hours that you really want to use. Allow the system to go beyond, and if you're setting up an overtime, uh, consider what could be the absolute latest uh, that a person might be asked to stay on site, uh, and then in the logic itself, uh, allow the system to schedule into an overtime as needed. Thank you. Let me know if this answers your question. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Great. So once you've set up a service resource uh, and, and you press save, it will take you to the full profile uh, of, the, of the mobile resource. So uh, I'm going to cover it very briefly. Um, you have a convenient uh, visual force component right at the center. The calendar shows uh, what is scheduled to this resource. Uh, and what he or she are supposed to do. Uh, the capacity is relevant if this is a capacity-based resource, and the skills section allows you to assign skills uh, to that resource, including skill level, uh, and you can also make skills phased, uh, as in expiring after a certain time frame if needed, usually relevant for uh, drug tests uh, that needs to be done uh, periodically or uh, certain certifications that might expire and require a renewal. So this is all here, uh, but going back to our discussion uh, on the sharing model uh, and setting things up properly uh, in your environment, uh, we, we're still at the stage of creating uh, service territories and now service territories members. So once you have a user configured with the right permission set uh, assignments, assignment and licenses, and you created a service resource that aligns to that user, the next thing you want to do uh, is to assign him or her to a territory. Now, Field Service Lightning today allows you uh, to be very fluid with service territory membership. So a person could belong to one territory today, to another territory tomorrow. A service resource could belong to one territory in general, but also be eligible to work in a secondary uh, territory. So service territory membership 
uh, is quite important, and this is the next step in the setup that I was talking about before. So uh, when you assign a membership, you take your resource, you select a service territory, you define if it's primary or secondary, uh, if you're using that logic, and we will talk about the logic for, uh, for this uh, on the third uh, webinar. Um, relocations is when you have a person working in just one single uh, area, and now you're relocating the person for a set period of time, and then eventually bringing that person back to his primary uh, set, uh, service territory. Uh, you give it an address. So this address, if you leave it blank, it will inherit the address of the service territory itself, if you have it there. If you give it another address, like the, the actual starting point at the beginning of the day uh, of that resource, when he or she relocated that service territory, this is the place to put the address. And most importantly, the start and the end date. The start is mandatory. You need to indicate to the system when this resource actually starts belonging to that particular service territory. And I cannot belong uh, as a primary uh, to more than one service territory at a time. And the service territory membership is at least 24 hours. Uh, so keep that at the back of your mind. But you can certainly set it up well into the future uh, if needed. Be mindful that you will only see the resource on the Gantt in that service territory beginning with the date that you configure here. So if you set up a service territory, remember, and then you go to the Gantt and you can't find him or her there, check what the star date is, go to that star date, uh, and sure enough, you should be able to see uh, that resource over there. So this is the service territory membership. And if I go back to our setup process, you will not see a service territory on the Gantt before it has at least one service territory member. Let me know if there's any questions on this. Okay. The next step for you is to set up the dispatcher. For a dispatcher to see the service territory or service territories that he or she are supposed to see, there's two steps that you need to undertake. First of all, user territories. <clears throat> Let's say I have San Francisco as a service territory, um, and I have a user. I, I, I have like. some questions. Sorry, Nico, I had some trouble pulling okay. the off. Okay. Uh, if for some reason you have multiple territories, they can have different addresses per territory address to uh, compare in addition to the default territory address. So if you have multiple um, resources in multiple, oh no, you have the same resource in multiple territories. They can have different addresses per territory in addition to the default territory address. That's the question. Okay, so yes, absolutely. When you set up, when you assign a resource to a service territory, you do it through the service territory membership. So I'm going to be a member of the Los Angeles service territory for this period of time. And when I'm a member of Los Angeles for this period of time, this is the address uh, that I belong to. This is the address that I start my day from, from that territory. You could set up the same service territory, you know, uh, for one day membership with one address, and then the second day membership with another address, and a third day membership with another address, so as much as needed. The answer is absolutely. When you are assigning a resource uh, to a service territory, you do it by making him a member of this service territory. The membership is time phased, and you can have, for that period of time, uh, any address you want. And of course, I can have multiple memberships configured for me for today, for next week, for next month, and every time it could be a completely different address. If I don't have an address, I'll just inherit the, def the default of that particular service territory. Okay, great. The next question, what is the difference between uh, service territory operating hours and service t uh, territory operating hour, and which overrides what? The, so, in Sorry, the, could you repeat the question, please? So, so it, what is the difference between service ter territory operating hours 
and service uh, territory um, operating our and which overrides yeah. what? Okay, I see the question. So uh, one is the service territory and one is a service resource. So service territory, um, let's say, um, you know, let, let's give you a live example. So I have various service territories here. I have Los Angeles. Okay, that's a service territory. And uh, the general operating hours for Los Angeles, for the business that we do in Los Angeles, um, is this. Uh, it's 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., and from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. is overtime. This is my standard. Okay? Now, this is, these are operating hours that I have assigned to the service territory called Los Angeles. Okay? This is my default. If I happen to be a member of this territory and I have no parameters set for myself, these will be the operating hours I will inherit when I become a member of the Los Angeles Service Territory. Now, imagine that um, I am I am Janice, okay, um, and I generally belong to San Francisco, but now I'm going to move to San to, to Los Angeles for a while. However, when I move to Los Angeles, I'm going to have hours of my own because I'm a part-time employee. So I'm not going to be able available for scheduling every day from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, and then the overtime. I'm going to have hours of my own. So I'm going to the operating hours object and I'm setting up opening hours for Janice part-time. And I'm going to say Monday 9 a.m. to 2 p.m and uh, Wednesday 9 to 1 or let's make it even better 10 to 1 okay so 9 to 2 and 10 to 1 Monday and Wednesday are the only times that Janice is going to be able to work so here I am 9 to 2 and 10 to 1 and I'm pressing the save button and now I'm going back to service territory membership, Janice Gonzalez, Los Angeles, going to belong uh, starting with this date and finishing with some other date. And here I'm going to set up the operating hours. Of Janice Gonzalez. Okay. The moment I press save, the system will know that between the 10th and the 17th, Janice is going to belong to Los Angeles but she's not going to submit to the usual hours of the service territory, but rather to hours of her own. So when, when Janice is going to be considered as a candidate for work assignment, it's going to be only within the hours that we set up on a specific calendar for her. So the biggest difference, you set up standard hours or default hours for the service territory for anyone who generally works in that area. And if the service operation you're implementing for is standard and everyone worked the same hours, you know, 9 to 5 or whatever it is, but if everybody works the same, it's easy. You don't have to set up a calendar for each person and set it up numerous times and etc. You just create one set of hours for this service territory and any resource inherits it as the moment he becomes a member of that service territory. In instances where you have resources, who are not submitting to the regular hours. They are either part-time, uh, or they are uh, working specific hours of the day, or they are more available than hours, or maybe they are unionized and the notion of overtime is different from them than the standard for that service territory. If you need to differentiate a specific resource and give him or her different hours than the default, this is where you assign uh, special operating hours specifically for that resource or group of resources when you make them a service territory member. So it's going from the default to the uh, to the one, and the pri and for the system, the priority uh, is the is the is the individual membership. So if I leave it blank, the system will go with the default of the service territory. If I populate this, 
that's the one the system is going to look at as a priority uh, and ignore for this specific resource, ignore the default hours of the territory, relying only on this calendar as my default for this resource. Um, do you want to take a couple more questions? Sure. Okay, good. Is there any validation to ensure overlapping or duplicate date ranges for service territory membership for the same resource? Yes. So uh, Janice currently belongs to San Francisco. If I'm pressing save, the system is, I think, is going to give me an error because she already uh, belongs to San Francisco. So I'm going to have to review her memberships. And con conveniently enough, I have it listed right here, service territories, right? So I can see that she belongs to San Francisco. There's a start date, but no end date. That field is not mandatory. So she just belongs to this indefinitely. Uh, if I edit this membership and I end it, let's say, yesterday, And now I'm going to add her uh, as a member to Los Angeles. It's going to allow me to do that. And since we're doing it, we might as well uh, put the calendar so I can also visualize it to you what it looks like on the Gantt. Okay, so you saw um, I had overlap and it didn't allow me to do so. The moment I fixed the overlap, it allowed me to give that new membership. So yes, there is a validation. Okay, you great. You cannot give membership, more than one membership, for a concurrent uh, period of time. And then, uh, no, the other question you already answered. Okay, great. No other questions so far. Thanks. Excellent. So where were we? Uh, we were uh, at setting up dispatchers. Uh, if you have any questions on the service territories, please let me know. OK. So now we're moving to setting up dispatchers. In order for, when you set up the environment, if you gave yourself all the permissions of the administrator, when you go to the Yant, um, it's going to load up. Um, if you have members in the service territories, it's going to show. Um, and, 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 it, and, it's, uh, and it's very jolly, and it's all good. However. When you're setting up a specific resource as a dispatcher, you gave that resource the needed PSL, he's got, he or she have the right permission set uh, configured, uh, but when they log in, they don't see the GAN. Why? There's two things that you really need to do for the dispatcher to start seeing her, his or her uh, territory. So you need to set up the user territories, and then you need to run the sharing automator. Very important element. So the first is user territories. So I decided that I'm going to allow Janice, sorry, I decided that I'm going to allow Janice to see Los Angeles. So I'm going to pick Los Angeles, and my user is going to be Janice. So by setting up user territories, I'm indicating to the system that Janice is going to act as a dispatcher, and she needs to be able to see Los Angeles service territory. Save. You would think that you're done, but you're not. Think about this. Service territory memberships are time phased. Right? I could be a member of Los Angeles today and a member of San Francisco tomorrow. Um, I could uh, I could be uh, Los Angeles could be primary and San Francisco could be secondary uh, service territory for me. Things could change very dynamically, and field service lighting was built to allow this. This was one of the limitations of field expert, and we knew that this is much in demand. So the system now allows this, and this is great. However, it's not as easy uh, to make sure that the dispatcher sees the right resources. So the first thing to say is define the territory. Uh, user territories allow you to set up the resource to see a specific territory. But then, what you want to do is to run the automator. So, sharing automator.
So you go to sharing and automation. There are several agents uh, in field service lighting or several automators to, to uh, run the optimization engine overnight uh, to automatically dispatch uh, at the beginning of the day. Uh, we're now talking about the sharing automation. So what the system needs to do is to run daily or every X amount of time uh, in validating who are the service uh, resources that belong to that territory for a particular day. Right, to ref so it needs to refresh every single day, in making sure that it shows the dispatcher all the needed resources. So you need to set up the automation, uh, uh, the sharing automator. You do it right here. Sharing, automation, new job. You select the territories that you want to control. You select the horizon, and you select how often it happens. Uh, best practice, do it once a day. Uh, because because membership is a minimum of 24 hours for a particular territory. So run the agent every 24 hours. So once you get it going, that's great. But if you want to be able to see uh, or validate that the dispatcher can see the territory right away, you just run that automator uh, now by pressing run now. So instead of waiting for the next batch when that is going to happen probably the next day from the moment you're, you're configuring the system, run now. Uh, and the system is going to refresh the sharing uh, and allow the dispatcher that you just configured to view the territory and the users and the service appointments or, or the resources and the service appointments within that particular territory. So this is the second step you need to do uh, to allow dispatchers uh, to start viewing their territory. Mind that this process is asynchronous, so it might take you uh, a few seconds until the territory becomes visible. So if you press run now and you immediately log the in as that resource and went to the Gantt and didn't see it, keep it a few moments, refresh, uh, and it will load up. Okay, we have two more questions. Um, in service, okay. in service territory, I can't see contractor the contractor field in my installation. What could cause that? Um, if you're looking at these fields, uh, these are custom fields uh, of a specific configuration that we did on the, or that I did on this particular org, so it's not out of the box. Uh, this is a configuration that uh, that we did in this uh, org to differentiate between different users uh, and, uh, and apply different scheduling logic to them. So I will expand on that uh, on the third section, uh, on the third webinar where, where and we're going to talk about scheduling logic um, and differentiating between groups of resources and applying the scheduling logic differently uh, to each and every resource. The org I'm showing you today is is an org that I'm using that I used for uh, for the for the two-day workshop that we conduct uh, worldwide uh, together with Salesforce and and dedicated for partners uh, when requested um, and. This is part of the logic, and I'm going to demonstrate some of that uh, on the third section. But out of the box, uh, you're not supposed to see anything here. You're mm -hmm. just going to see this part, and that's it. OK, great. One more question. So can a dispatcher perform the role of a technician and vice versa? Yes, absolutely. If you assign uh, the permission set and the licenses of the dispatcher and the resource, or a mobile resource uh, to, the same, to the same user, that user will be able to be both a mobile resource as well as a dispatcher. Uh, the comment that I made before is do not set up a dispatcher first as a service resource and then as a dispatcher. This is an unnecessary step. Uh, you, don't, you usually don't want to see the dispatcher as a mobile resource, and this is not required. Just give that dispatcher dispatcher the permission set uh, needed uh, and set up the user territories, run the automator, the dispatcher will get visibility to the GAN. But yes, if you needed the same resource to be both, you absolutely can. And uh, in fact, there's quite a few uh, customers that uh, already run with this with a similar configuration with where a single user is both a mobile resource to whom a job can be scheduled to, as well as the dispatcher that can actually log in and see the GAN. Thanks, Nico. That, that was it for questions. Excellent. So that was uh, the sharing model. Uh, definitely, it's, it's, it's almost 
if you want to take a full advantage of the system, you have to go with the private sharing model. There's no reason to go public, uh, and, and that's really pretty much the only way for you to leverage uh, the full abilities of the scheduling logic and the flows that we built uh, within Field Service Lightning. Okay, so uh, data integration rules. It's not really disabling them, uh, it's rather unchecking uh, a certain box, so I'll show it to you in a moment. So uh, data integration rules are active by default uh, in orgs that are FSL enabled. Uh, and remember, uh, you don't just take any org uh, to implement field service lighting on or install the managed package on. It needs to be a, 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 an org that is specifically enabled for field service lighting. So presumably uh, a customer that has subscribed to field service lightning uh, licenses from Salesforce uh, and, and received in return an org uh, with, uh, with field service lighting enabled or got the field service uh, lightning provisioned uh, to an existing org. So data integration rules are active by default, uh, but uh, what we want to make sure is to bypass certain triggers to allow geocoding to run smoothly. And we use geocoding to calculate uh, travel, uh, to calculate distance, to calculate uh, priority of a resource based on uh, geographical uh, proximity to a specific service appointment. So for this, we need to make sure that we are bypassing triggers. Uh, we expect that this will become a default uh, setting uh, in one of the versions, but for now, you need to make sure that you remember, uh, rem that you remember uh, to do it. So where do you do it? Data management, data integration rules. Um, you have the list uh, of the objects that you want to manipulate. So it's the resource absence, service appointment, service territory, service territory member, work order, and a work order line item. So you simply go into each and every one of these objects, you edit the rule settings, and you make sure that the, this box that will be ticked by default uh, on an org that you set up today, just untick that box. That box. That's it. That's all you need to do. Uh, and this will allow geocoding to run smoothly uh, as needed by field service lighting in your environment. Very straightforward. Hopefully, uh, will become uh, default in the next uh, version or the next releases. But for now, be mindful of that. Otherwise, geocoding is not going to work properly. Um, so we have a question uh, from Mohit. Uh, if two technicians are working on the same order, uh, then shall we still go for private model for work orders for the private sharing? Yes, absolutely. Definitely go private for, uh, for the object model. Um, if two resources are working on the same work order, uh, presumably they will have e each uh, a service appointment assigned to them that is related to that work order, uh, and then they will be able to see it by default uh, by how Field Service Lightning works. Uh, if you have a service appointment, you are able to see its work order. The sharing rules of Field Service Lightning allow you to do it, so yes, stay private. Uh, now, if you need to go beyond this, if you need to make it public, public from some reason, um, that will be your call to make. But um, in the context of field service lightning uh, and field service in general, uh, when you have scenarios where two resources are working on the same work order, uh, it will allow them to see it because each will have his own service appointment related to that work order, um, and that will by default allow them to see it. Okay, all clear. Excellent. Uh, feed tracking uh, in service appointments, uh, a very quick one uh, but important. So chatter, feed tracking, uh, will leverage tracking, uh, uh, chatter in field service lighting, and you really want to make sure that uh, feed tracking is, is, is enabled on the service appointment, and mo more specifically on the status within the service appointment. So enable, select the status. Selecting the status will allow you to keep track um, and communicate uh, around the transitions of a service appointment from assigned to dispatched uh, 
to complete it and whatever other flows you're going to say. We'll leverage Chatter to notify uh, mobile resources by email, uh, by pushing it to their mobile application. So uh, feed tracking is quite important to allow that, that level of collaboration. Very straightforward, and it's just a service appointment that we care about. Enable, select status, press save, and you're good to continue on. The next one is page layout assignment. And page layout assignment is, is very important to consider in field service lightning. Remember how I showed you before when we went to a mobile resource uh, that they have this visual force component that allows you to manage the calendars, the skills, the capacity. This is a visual force component for the service resource. Uh, the system is packed with all sorts of field visual force components uh, and other elements that are extremely important for each and every one of the roles in the field service lighting. So to take the guesswork out of your implementation process and trying to figure out what is used for what and what should be visible for each user, uh, we make sure you're leveraging the field service lighting page layout assignment. And you do it for these five objects. Setup, Manage Users, Profile, Sysadmin, Page Layout section. Manage Users, Profile, System Administrator, and your layouts will be right here. Here are all the objects that you, that you need to be worried about. So if we're talking about uh, service resource, This will be the field service lighting service resource layout. View the assignment, um, and when you and press edit the assignment, uh, the default will be the the, the service resource uh, layout, right? Uh, and what you want to do is to make sure that the field service lighting service layout is selected. So um, I did it by I, I selected the first one. I'm holding shift. I, I'm pressing the last one, and all profiles are selected. If there are certain profiles that don't make sense to you, uh, you can, of course, remove them. Select the layout, uh, the field service lightning uh, service resource layout. Save. And this will assure that the right fields, that the right components, that the right visual force pages are all uh, visible uh, on these objects to the right profiles. So page layout assignment will make your life so much easier uh, in making sure that you're seeing all the right things and able to access all the needed components uh, within each and every one of these objects. Okay. And the last one is service territories uh, modeling. So service territories, as I mentioned before, uh, and I'll repeat just in case, uh, could be uh, a geographical uh, breakdown or a functional breakdown. At the end of the day, it's how the mobile resources or the service resources are grouped. Have a conversation with the service operation, with your, with your customer. Have a conversation in understanding how are they grouping their folks today. Right? Chances are you're not coming to a brand new operation, so they have some sort of a way of grouping their resources. Uh, more often than not, it's going to be geographical, um, if they operate in a single uh, geographical area, it's probably going to be functional maintenance versus installation versus emergency response or any other grouping. You have the ability to set up both geographic or uh, or functional. There's really it, it really doesn't matter for the system. It's just how it's going to be grouped. It's how it's going to be presented. Uh, to the dispatcher, it's who is going to have access to what in terms of being able to view the resources, their service appointments, etc. A few best practices around service territories. So you want to make sure that there are less than 50 service resources per service territory. Um, if you have a, an organization with, I don't know, 4,000 resources, all operating in a single city, 
I guarantee you that there's going to be some sort of a division. Maybe they're breaking down the city to several parts, or they're doing different things. And if there isn't, contemplate with your customer how to bring it down to a manageable level, because there, there, there's, no, there's no chance that there will be a single dispatcher managing 4,000 people. In fact, if you come into an organization that runs uh, manual or relatively simple scheduling systems in managing their field operations, you're going to find uh, a dispatcher who, who may also be called a service manager or a scheduler or something else, but you're going to find most likely a ratio of one dispatcher per 15 to 20 mobile employees. So that's going to be that dispatcher's, dispatcher's service territory, these 15 or 20 employees. Field Service Lightning, with its uh, advanced scheduling capabilities, with its automation tools, empowers dispatchers to manage as many as 50 mobile resources. Uh, in, in my years of, of uh, field service sales, I've never seen a dispatcher that manages much more uh, than 50 unless it's uh, you know contractors that have like one job uh, a day or something. But 50 resources per service territory is pretty much the maximum you want uh, to have. Now think about a scenario where you have mobile resources doing, say, five jobs uh, each, and then you have five service appointments times 50 employees. That's 250 service appointments that you need to visualize uh, on the game. Even that is a lot of scrolling up and down uh, on the GAN, even if you make the lines, uh, uh, on the, if you put the lines on the smallest setting. So this is an important element to keep in mind. Go beyond 50 uh, with, with, with a similar level of service appointments, and you will start encountering uh, performance issues in loading uh, the GAN. So this is the best practice, uh, first and foremost. Best practice both in terms of the system's performance itself, as well as the field operation. A dispatcher might have several service territories, uh, and maybe he's responsible for you know, 500 resources because so many of them are part-time. But break them down to different groups, break them down to service territories, uh, and make sure that there isn't more than 50 uh, in each one. Uh, we have a question, Nico. So how can I ensure that work orders are visible based on dispatcher and technician territory? So if I'm a technician that, that belongs to Los Angeles and I'm a dispatcher that, that was set up for the user territory to manage Los Angeles, I will see you, the technician, and I will see your uh, service appointment. Thanks. With that in mind, you also want to minimize the service territories themselves. Ideally, you want to have one. But if you have more than 50 resources, you're going to have to have a few more. But try to save yourself from a situation where you have numerous service territories with five or ten resources in each. In that case, where you only have a few resources in each service territory, consolidate. Work with your customer on consolidating those service territories to bring them to that 50 uh, maximum number so you don't have too many of them to manage. Uh, minimizing service territories is a very good practice, both from an administrative perspective as well as from the dispatcher's user experience. Um, Jumping from one service to another, to another, to another, to another is just crazy. So if I'm a single uh, dispatcher and I have several responsibilities, try to consolidate these responsibilities into as few service territories as possible. Questions? Uh, no questions. Okay. So find the balance. And uh, finding the balance is, uh, is the name of the game with field service implementations. Uh, your customers will, will come with, uh, with a long list of conflict, conflicting uh, demands uh, all across the board. They will want to, pr to deliver best customer service, but they will, will want to save on overtime and operational costs. Uh, they will want to uh, increase efficiency uh, and, and minimize travel, uh, but also uh, provide 
uh, the fastest service possible. So there's always going to be conflict uh, in their demand. So finding the right balance, finding that, that golden middle ground that will satisfy uh, the customer requirements uh, is the name of the game. And it doesn't mean that you need to get it right from the first time. Agree with, and going back to our conversation at the beginning of this deck uh, on, that, on that field service journey, agree on minimum viable requirements. What's going on in the field now, and what will be the first most dramatic improvement that we can bring to the field immediately? Set up, you will, you will see that uh, everything is about balance, all the way to the scheduling policies. And you will set up certain objectives that you will want to optimize towards, and you will give them different weights. Hopefully, the metrics that you have set up from the beginning will allow you and your customer to measure the efficacy of the operation, to measure the gradual improvement and the impact uh, of the automation uh, that you, uh, and the streamlining that you bring to that, uh, to that company with field service lighting. And that, these same metrics will also, should, should also give you the ability to, uh, to tweak the logic and say, okay, well, uh, we're talking about service territories. Uh, the dispatcher worked with the service territories for a month, and it's just not enough. There's, uh, there's, there's, there's not enough service territories. We have to divide it because uh, one part of the day the person focuses on this territory, and another part of the day he focuses on that aspect just too confusing to have everybody together. Let's reconsolidate and, and set up a few more service territories to make things easier for the dispatcher to prioritize. Uh, on another hand, you will see that the dispatcher just jumps from one place to another and could we please have all of these resources in one single place and you will test and you will experiment uh, until you find the right balance. But with that guideline of keeping no more than 50 resources in a single service territory and striving to minimize the service territories. When you're thinking about finding the balance, you and your customer will already be on the right path uh, to follow best practices and, and, and being faster in finding that right balance uh, for your organization. So that's service territories modeling. Great. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left. Okay. Are there any questions? Uh, no questions. Okay. In that case, let's talk a little bit about skills and see if we can get to work orders, although I'm inclined to leave work orders for another time. Maybe we'll talk about them briefly. So <clears throat> after you have set up your, uh, your mobile resources, um, and you've set up your dispatchers and your service territories, uh, everything that we discussed today, once this is in place, the next thing for you to do uh, will be to start setting up the work, uh, the actual work types uh, that, the, that the individuals are going to perform out in the field. And you start with the skills. So skills are administered from the setup section, not field service admin, but rather from setup. And if you search for skills here, you will find quite a few skills. So there's work.com skills, there's field service, service resource skills. The one that you care about most at the moment is the skills. Field service skills. Go here. And this is the place where you essentially list the skill set that the mobile resources have. So you can see a few that I created here. So uh, it could be literally anything. Uh, it could be um, able to repair X. It could be expert on uh, equipment brand Y. It could also be uh, certification. It could also be the drug tests uh, I mentioned. And if they're periodic, you might want to give them a quarter or some other indication of time. But these are the skills. <clears throat> and all you need to do here is just to give it a name, press tab and give it an API. That's it. Completely ignore uh, assigning to users here and press save. Once you created the skills here, you're good to proceed to work types. Now, work types are the templates, the templates of the work that you will later on be scheduling. So um, if it's a, 
Um, if it's a repair, uh, a home services repair uh, company, uh, it might be um, uh, repairing uh, a sink or repairing uh, a closet or installing a security system. Um, if it's a medical healthcare uh, use case, it could be uh, a certain type of test. Uh, or a certain type of doctor visitation, uh, or a certain type of doctor appointment that might be taking place. These are the work types. These are the templates that you will later on be scheduling. So when you're set, setting up work types, just have a conversation with your customer about what kind of work do you do, what kind of services do you offer, and what do you know about these services. So give it a name that makes sense. A description, wherever you can put a description, we highly recommend that you do because later on it helps uh, your your uh, successors uh, to understand what was it all about and what were you trying to do here. Uh, it will give you a good reminder on what you were configuring. Uh, and overall, it's just a good practice to describe what you're doing and we give you an opportunity to do so here. Now, Duration is a very important element because this is how the system will be actually scheduling. You know, you're scheduling an hour worth of work and the system is going to help you to figure out where, who, uh, and when uh, that job should be done. So duration is quite important. You can set up minutes or hours, no, note that, and then you just give a numerical value uh, on the line below. Due date offset is quite important. Due date offset is sort of the SLA um, of, uh, of, the, of the work types um, on setting up the due date. How, how soon or what's the deadline? How soon from the moment that the, a service appointment is created, what is the absolute deadline to complete it? So if it's an emergency work, it could be four hours. Uh, if it's uh, if it's some sort of a customer service or an installation, it could be three or seven days. Ask your customer, what is the standard time frame that you promise to the customers uh, to deliver that service. Now, you will schedule an appointment more often than not, but what's an acceptable time frame? The due date offset field will automatically populate the due date on the service appointment itself, and the system will always strive to schedule pro and make sure that this, the service appointment completes before that due date, and the due date offset is, is, is the field that manipulates that. Note that the due date offset is figured in minutes. So if, you are, uh, if your timeline is three days, you essentially need to do 60 minutes times, uh, times 24 hours in a day times three days. So let's quickly run the, ma the math. That will be 1,443 minutes. And that's the value that you put here. So remember, the due date offset is going to later on automatically set <clears throat> uh, the due date on the service appointment. Another thing it's going to affect is the scheduling horizon that it's going to offer on appointment booking functionality. So when you book appointments, you're going to see a list of available time slots to schedule this work. That initial horizon before you extend the date uh, that will be shown will be affected by the due date offset of the work that you have selected. So you're creating work orders, and work orders is the object that holds the type of work that you are delivering, and this is what we're configuring here. More often than not, you will want to proceed immediately to schedule the work order. Now, you're not scheduling the work order object itself. You're scheduling service appointments that are related to, to that work order. So you always want to make sure that you check order creation of service appointments. So when you created that work order, it automatically will create service appointments. Before you ask questions, you don't always have to start your scheduling process from a work order. You could, it could be as simple as going to your customer's account pressing the quick action of book appointment and scheduling right from there without going the multiple steps. But <clears throat> behind the scenes, the system will create a work order and a service appointment and schedule that service appointment. So you that service appointments are automatically created. In instances 
where instead of offering a time frame to your customers, you're going to offer an exact time, which is uh, very prevalent when uh, you're scheduling sales appointments, so the traveling salesperson scenario, where you, when you're setting up <clears throat> uh, doctor appointments, uh, whether it's in an office or uh, a, a doctor that or a nurse that actually visits on site. But these are the kind of appointments that instead of offering a window, you're going to agree on an exact time. So uh, if this type of work uh, calls for an exact uh, time slot for an appointment, uh, you check the last box of exact appointment. Once you save, it takes you to the work type detail. So here's everything we just selected and configured. And you have the skills editor. And remember how we created skill C? Here it is, right here. So the word type, beyond containing the duration, the SLA, uh, of, or the, the, the due date uh, standard for that word type, it's also going to hold the required skills and even skill levels when relevant. Uh, this will be the required skill uh, that one a service resource will need to have in order to qualify to complete this particular type of work order. If you're setting up skills, don't forget to press save. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Go ahead. So, so the first one is in regards of lightning readiness. So is this lightning ready? Yes. Okay, good, short answer. Uh, next question, if we have a customer visit where we have uh, to do two types of work type, uh, two types of work types, example inspection and maintenance, do we create two work orders? Uh, yes, um, you either create one work order with two service appointments uh, or you actually create two work orders. Um, if you're scheduling them together and you want to make sure that it's the same person, uh, uh, you relate them uh, to one another, so service appointments can actually be related to one another uh, to a maximum of two at the moment. So the system will, and this will allow the system to make sure that it schedules to the same person uh, both appointments, and then it will put it together uh, at the sort of same start or start after finish one after another. But you can you can establish critical dependency between service appointments. That's one way to go, or you can create a work order uh, and create the service appointments within them. And then the next one, what is the easiest way to have a default set of work order line items, for example, a checklist for specific work types, uh, as an example, for inspection at the following work order line items? <clears throat> so uh, the work type is just the defining, uh, a, a definer of what needs to be done. Uh, on the work orders, and we'll talk about it in the next sections, but on the work orders, the work order line items are often the describers of what needs to be done, uh, and it's reflected on the mobile, but it relates to one specific uh, uh, service appointment at a time. So you're scheduling someone to install X, uh, and in that work order, you can have a template of, of work order line items that will indicate uh, when you're going into it to do this installation, do one and then two and then three and then four to complete the job. So this will be this will be the default setting. If you have a single work order that you want to trigger multiple service appointments from, so each work order line item is a different service appointment, a different work type, this will be a bit of a customization that you need to do and I suggest that we take it offline. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, this brings my presentation to conclusion. I hope this was useful and, uh, and educational. Thank you so much, Nico. This was really awesome. I'm so glad we have um, this now recorded and available for our partners. Uh, we, are, we'll, it, we will be building up on this in, in the next two weeks, continuing with um, mobile configuration and then also uh, going deeper on scheduling. Uh, thank you for your time today. Uh, I will be posting the recording to the Field Service Experts Chatter Group in the partner community. Uh, if you have not joined, please go to partners.sales com and join the partner community and uh, join our chatter group and ask the questions there as well. So thank you again and have a great day and we talk to you same time next week.
Bye. Thanks. Bye.